hello again. Uh, if we can call this meeting to order, please, in an opening prayer, Chloe. We offer up our prayers this evening for the deceased members of our extended Halton Catholic system. Matthew Smiley, father of Kelly Rowe, retired elementary school teacher of our board, father-in-law to father-in-law of John Mark Rowe, Halton Hills trustee of the board, and grandfather to both Aaron Rowe, secondary teacher at Christ the King Catholic Secondary School in Georgetown, and Stephanie Rowe, teacher teacher of the arts at Holy Rosary Catholic Elementary School. Barry Joseph Means, father of Patrick Means, principal at Lumen Christi Catholic Elementary School in Milton, father-in-law of Amy Maine, teacher at Holy Rosary Catholic Elementary School in Burlington, and grandfather of Alexandria Thompson, long-term supply teacher, long-term occasional teacher at St. Elizabeth Seton Catholic Elementary School in Burlington. Joseph McPherson, father of Carol Caverly, retired principal. Janet Kamuzi, mother of Kit Lafarette, principal at St. Francis of Assisi's Catholic Elementary School in Georgetown. John McKee, father of Debbie Sutton, teacher at Guardian Angels Elementary School, Catholic Elementary School in Milton, and father-in-law of Craig Sutton, teacher at Holy Cross Catholic Elementary School. Susan O'Connor, wife of Kevin O'Connor, elementary school teacher in, at St. Timothy's Catholic Elementary School in Burlington. A time of year, even though we're even though thinking though thinking of the subject of time may prove discomforting, it is not a bad it is not a bad idea, especially at the beginning of a new year. As we look into the year, we look at a block of time. We see 12 months, 52 weeks, 365 days, 8,760 hours, 5,000 5, minutes. 31 million 500, 536,000 seconds. All of that is a gift from God. We have done nothing to deserve it, earn it, or purchase it. Like the air we breathe, time comes to us as a part of life. The gift of time is not ours alone. It is given equally to each person. Rich or poor, educated or ignorant, strong and weak, every man, woman, and child has the same 24 hours every day. Another important thing about time is that you cannot stop it. There is no way to slow it down, turn it off, or adjust it. Time marches on, and you cannot bring it, you cannot bring back time. Once it is gone, it is gone. Yesterday is lost forever. If yesterday is lost, tomorrow is uncertain. We may look ahead at a full year's block of time, but we really have no guarantee what we, if we will experience any of it. Obviously, time is one of our most precious possessions. We cannot waste it. We cannot worry over it. We can spend it on ourselves. Or, as good stewards, we can invest it in the kingdom of God. The new year is full of time. As the seconds tick away, will you be tossing time out the window? Or will you be making every minute count? And with that, I say Happy New Year. And in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Chloe. Um, Arlene, would you... Please uh, adopt the motion to camera. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, from our HR resources, uh, we have uh, acting elementary vice principal, Suzanne Rossini, appointed as acting elementary vice principal, effective January 5th, 2015 to January 27th, 2015. And we have a retirement of Penny Michelek, effective of Jan er, I'm sorry, March 31st, 2015. That's it. Thank you. Uh, if we can have uh, approval of the agenda for this evening. Anthony? Could I add something to the agenda, please, under miscellaneous information? I'd like to add uh, information on the Smart Start Halton program and the Canada Learning Bond. Okay. So are, are you moving also with the amended agenda? Yes. Seconder, please. Mark, all in favor? So approved. Is there any declarations of conflict of interest? Seeing none. Uh, we have with us tonight Terry Durham from the Religion and Family Life 
and she's going to give us an overview of the religious education curriculum. Good evening, Terry. we should look at is why the decision was made to create an elementary religious education policy document at this time. And um, the church has recognized, not just in the province of Ontario, but in our, the entire Catholic world, that um, our 21st century learners require a distinctive approach to religious education using the new evangelization. So the church re has recognized that we're in a moment. Our previous religious education programs were designed to be delivered to students who were born into Catholic families, raised as believers from the cradle, attended church regularly, and were fed in their faith from both their parents and the parish before they even came into our, our schools. Um, our educators were then charged with a mandate to deepen up faith that already existed. And that was the design of our religious education program and the current one that we are using from the Canadian Catholic bishops, um, Born of the Spirit and We Are Strong Together, is designed with that premise. What the church recognized is that that's no longer the case for us in Catholic schools. And again, I'd like to emphasize that that's all over the world, not just in Ontario. The last three popes have been talking about the new evangelization. And there's been a recognition that there's actually three groups of people who identify themselves as Catholics. There are the believers that I just spoke to. And then there is the group that we would call the seekers. And those are um, people who identify themselves as Catholic, who believe that there's something out there, but have not made a total commitment to their faith. And so they may attend church sporadically, and they may not really understand a lot about church teaching, but they have some belief. And then we also are faced with having um, non-believers who also identify themselves as Catholic, but may never have attended church and may not nurture the faith life of their children at home. In recognizing this, the church has called all of us, not just Catholic teachers, but all Catholics, to a mandate of a new evangelization which doesn't look outside of the church and go to non-believers and say, come and join us, but rather looks within and says, we are going to um, nurture your faith from within. And so our new curriculum is designed to do just that. It's designed to provide foundational knowledge of church teachings to our students so that they can have an authentic encounter with Jesus Christ. I like to think of it as our, our current program delivered a faith that was up here, and the new program is providing the foundational pieces that are down here that our students need to grow. The other reason that we created it is that in our elementary system, religion and family life were the only subject areas um, that didn't have a curriculum policy document. Um, developing a policy document gives religion and family life the same weight and authority as all of our other uh, curriculum subject areas have. And it also provides an opportunity for parents to know exactly what program is going to be delivered to their students and exactly what their students are learning in each grade level. And thirdly, it provides some standards for assessing achievement by providing us with an achievement chart. So those are all the reasons that the document was created. The Assembly of Catholic Bishops of Ontario worked together with the Institute for Catholic Education to develop the policy document, and in that document, they incorporated the Ontario Ministry of Education program and programs and policies, including their policy on assessment. They incorporated our scripture and tradition. They incorporated insights from the General Directory for Catechesis, and they incorporated the needs of the Ontario Catholic educational community. So our document, our new document, is very strongly based in 
the Catechism of the Catholic Church and the Ontario Catholic Graduate Expectations. So our program, the, the CCB program, bef that program does not have curriculum expectations. That program was the resource itself, and it was dedicated to catechesis, and catechesis is primarily parish-centered, directed at believers, the context is liturgical celebrations, the focus is the mysteries of the faith, and it is working to deepen the understanding of a faith that already exists. The new program, which is also, uh, which in going along with the curriculum document, the resources that are being developed to go with it come from the Assembly of the Catholic Bishops of Ontario. That new program and that new resource will be school-centered, it will address the needs of those three groups of students I mentioned, the believers, the seekers, and the non-believers. It will be primarily a scholastic discipline with curricular expectations. It will work in an interdisciplinary dialogue so that these expectations will be able to be infused across the curriculum in all subject areas, so to increase the Catholicity piece, and it's the first step in the new evangelization. It's designed to have, an, uh, uh, have students develop an authentic relationship with Jesus, that's at the center, and it'll do that through teaching in six strands, believing, celebrating, living a moral life, living in communion, living in solidarity, and teaching to pray. In knowing that we're providing a greater foundation um, to, for a basis of faith, and so that students can begin to develop a faith, there's a recognition that our teachers are going to need a stronger theological background to deliver the program. And the new resource that I mentioned, uh, the bishops have contracted Pearson to develop that, and they are putting in very strong theological pieces for teachers to access so that they'll be able to deliver that program with the authority and knowledge that they need to deliver it. Because of that, we made the decision to do a staggered implementation of this document. Last year we in-serviced teachers and administrators on the document itself and the new evangelization so that they are becoming familiar with the document, with the language in the document, and with their mandate to the new evangelization. This year in the spring, grade one, the grade one resource from Pearson will be available. It's a very comprehensive resource. We will be purchasing it and interviewing our teachers on it in the spring and we will have mandatory implementation of grade one in September 2015. After that, two grade levels per year will be available. We will purchase those as they become available in service to teachers and have the mandatory implementation the following September. Um, so that's our plan for rolling it out. Teachers, I'd like you to know that teachers have expressed great deal of interest and excitement in this document. They're very excited to be teaching it. They um, have actually asked if they can use it before mandatory implementation happens. We have said, of course you may. Um, we've asked that if they do that, they do that with grade level partners. And in support of that, we've purchased 50 study Bibles per school so that they'll have the scriptural background that they need to teach the course if they want to jump into it. And um, but in the meantime, we will be keeping our, uh, our assessment and our reporting the way that we always do it this year, and we will be changing it as we implement in each new grade. We will be looking at how we report and how we assess. So there will be in-servicing about that going along as well. So we have a lot of work, but it's exciting work. And um, does anyone have any questions? Yes? Oh, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, geez, this is exciting. Um, can you tell me roughly how long you think it will take? I'm assuming this, does this go to grade 12? And, and uh, no. Just, is this just, is just elementary? This is just elementary. So uh, within three to four years? Yeah, about uh, approximately three to four years to get up to the grade 8 level. Okay. And um, that's why we're, for teachers that are excited to use it, we're, we're, incur we're encouraging them to do that but we just haven't mandated, but we are putting the supports in place for the teachers that want to use that, 
and the Catholic Curriculum Corporation has also developed a, a document that hasn't been released yet, but will be being released for grades seven and eight to sort of fill in that gap for people that want to jump into it. But the main resource that they'll be using until that time will still be the CCPD resource. Okay, and all teachers will be in service on this? Uh, yes, all teachers will be in service. We in serviced um, the school program team leaders and the administrators last year and uh, charge them with coming back to their schools and in servicing all of their staff in, in this school year so that everyone is ready to go. We also created, pardon me, we also created a curriculum correlation that shows the um, expectations. It, it demonstrates which ones are in the current program and which ones they would need to have supplemental resources for. We did that for all grade levels with our itinerant teachers so that teachers who want to use the document now can go to StaffNet, access their grade, and see where they would need to get supplemental resources to support them. So we are supporting them, looking at it and delving into it. Um, I just had a quick question, kind of an extension of Arlene's. You said that you would be introducing the, the further grades beyond three as the resources became available, so they're not even out there yet. No, no resources are, are out there. Pearson will have the grade one ready in the spring where it, it's imminent and we'll purchase that. We uh, Last year the budget was approved to purchase that, so we're ready to go and purchase that. The grade two will be ready next September and the grade three will be ready next December. Those are their timelines, so we're hoping then next year we'll purchase those and then implement the following September. And this is religion and family life. The family life doc, no, this is religion. The family life document also was released around the same time. The family life document was slightly different in that it is completely aligned to the resources that already existed. So our teachers have been able to implement that family life document fully without the need for us to purchase new resources. And uh, the resources are, as I said, completely aligned with it so they could continue to deliver the programming that they've already been delivering. Are there any other questions? Anthony? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So how does this relate to the Fully Alive program, or how does it complement the Fully Alive program? And uh, can you send us a link to the policy document? Is it in complete form? So the Fully Alive program is a portion of our religious education um, components in our schools, and the Fully Alive program focuses on developing the human, the human person and the religious education program focuses on all the other um, aspects of Catholic life, including pieces of developing the person. We're not ignoring the development of the person, but it focuses more on the traditions and scriptures of the church. So, um, sorry, the traditions of the church. So things such as teaching scripture, teaching them to understand what the sacraments are, teaching them to understand what prayer is, teaching them to do the Catholic social teach, to understand the Catholic social teaching. The Fully Alive program teaches our students how to be in relationship and how to be sexual beings in the world. It's not doesn't teach them how to have sex. It teaches them how to use their gift of sexuality properly. So the two programs complement each other. However, they are two separate curriculum documents. They're, they're not married. In gray, in our secondary schools, we've always had uh, curriculum documents, and in our secondary schools, the Family Life Program is integrated into the Religious Education Program. But in elementary, they are two separate documents, but one program. In, in general, we allot four periods a week for religion and one period a week for family life, because it's part of religion. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the second part of your question. Oh, the, uh, you referred to the policy document, which isn't part of the package, so I just wondered where that Oh, I do have policy documents available for you. Thank you for asking that. And um, they're available for anyone who would like one. And you could pick that up at the at end of the meeting if you'd like, or if you'd like it now, then I can get one for you. Anthony? Thank you very much for the presentation. If we're now looking at students as believers or searchers or non-believers, and not as Catholics in our elementary schools anymore. What is the relationship with the with the 
sacramental teachings that we're going through? Oh, I think I would like to clarify that we're definitely looking at them as Catholics. But what? But what if, if you're a not believer, you're not a Catholic. If you're a searcher, you're still not a Catholic. I, I understand that from our perspective, but from the perspective of their self-identification, they're identifying themselves as Catholics. So what we're doing and what the popes are doing, because this new evangelization comes from the last three popes, what the popes are doing is inviting those who identify themselves as Catholic but don't attend church to develop a faith so that they can become practicing Catholics. And that's what, what our but, focus is. But in grade one, that's the popes are talking to parents, not to students in grade one. If, if we are going to have a first communion program in this grade two, mm -hmm. and we're going to say, well, it's okay to be a non-believer. This is a program that you can still get involved with. It's okay to be a searcher. You don't really have to worry about your first communion. I think when we're sorry, I'm yeah, I don't you'll have to hear. I think when we're using that language, we're using that language as adults. Yes. I don't. We're not using that language in the classroom. We're not saying it's okay to be a non-believer. It's okay to be a a seeker. That would not be the language that we use. We would use the journey, the language of you're on a faith journey, and we're helping you develop your faith. And I think that that is that that it applies to anyone, um, even the strong believer in Catholics. We're all on faith journey. So that would be the language that we use in the classroom. We would not be identifying you're a non-believer, you're a seeker, you're a believer. Everyone will be getting the same foundational program. Okay. Thank you. One more to you, Madam Chair. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Just, um, just concerning uh, the assessment portion uh, of this. Because I've heard uh, some concerns amongst parents and even even students in the, the latter grades on on the assessment of, of the program. Um, how does it change with with this new implementation? Parents are always concerned that we're going to be assessing faith and values, and we have never assessed faith and values, and we will continue to not assess faith and values. What this document provides is an achievement chart for the religious literacy. So we're having the students develop religious literacy. So those are your, your ability to have knowledge about your faith. That's your ability to apply your knowledge about your faith. That's a, your ability to think about the world through the lens of your faith. Those are the things that the achievement chart will assess. So parents do not need to worry that we're going to be assessing what kind of Catholic they are or how deep their faith is. It will be, it, and th that achievement chart, it will be the same achievement chart that is in other subject areas. So it will have the four categories of knowledge, thinking, application, and communication. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you, you mentioned the last three popes call for uh, new, evangelization. new evangelization, which is primarily achieved through catechesis, mm -hmm. uh, which is a term that all of them have, have used, and more than just the last three. But um, the slide uh, that showed the that, difference that shows between the catechesis and religious education. Yeah, does that mean that there's less emphasis, emphasis on catechesis? No, or that it's not being done. No, in fact, in fact, catechesis is still at the heart of the program. It's the approach to the catechesis that is that is happening in a different way. It's absolutely not out the window, so to speak. It's absolutely there, and that's why the center of the program is that relationship with Jesus. The difference is the, it, the difference is is providing those pieces that may have been traditionally provided by parents, and the parish before catechesis occurred, the school will now be providing opportunities for that and for that growth. So catechesis. Any other questions of Terry? Thank you very much for coming tonight. And it was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We have no delegations. Uh, I'm looking for an approval of the minutes of December 16th. I will say uh, in regards to my item that was added to that agenda and writing a letter to the Halton Region Health Department in regards to the incident has not been written yet. It will go out this week, and I will send a copy to you all. Um, we'll be discussing that a little bit later. So may I have a... Yes. Thank you, Paul. Seconder? Anthony? All in favor? Thank you. 
moved. Business arising, or excuse me, arising from previous meetings. It's summarized on page 17. Does anybody have any questions? There's no uh, response delegation. There are no action items. And we're on to Director Dawson with the strategic planning process framework. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm pleased to present the staff report read this evening on uh, an outline for the framework and the process that uh, we are about to undertake to begin our next phase for strategic planning. All district school boards in Ontario are required to develop multi-year plans um, and they need to be aimed at achieving the following goals, promoting student achievement and well-being, ensuring effective effective stewardship of the board's resources, and delivering effective and appropriate education programs to its pupils. The last round of strategic planning in 2010 began with a development, a renewal process of the vision, and that was the initiating factor for uh, developing the five-year strategic plan called Fulfilling the Promise 2010-2015. And at that time, the board also developed the focus on faith initiative to ensure that an infusion of faith in every aspect of our content and processes occurred. Last year in the spring, um, the board of trustees recognized that we were about to embark on a new round of strategic planning and at a policy committee meeting um, reviewed the board's mission and vision and values and it was determined that the values required some revision to bring them in alignment with the mission and vision. And on October 21st, um, the board approved the new value statement, which will help to lay the foundation for this next strategic planning process. So our strategic plan is scheduled to expire at the end of, 20, of 2015, and so we need to initiate this process. A roadmap, a strategic plan is a roadmap for the long-term goals of an organization, and it's a framework for more detailed planning and decision-making. But the strategic planning process is not the plan itself, but rather a process we need to develop this plan. The Ministry of Education has provided a guidebook called the Strategic Planner's Guidebook Resource for Ontario School Boards, a six-phase uh, framework for planning with multiple components which also include communication as an ongoing activity in each phase of the, of the plan. The phases are preparing the plan where a timeline and identifying who will lead the process is determined. Phase two talks about content, context setting where we will analyze internal and external circumstances influence, influencing the school board where we gather and analyze data. Phase three is a consultation phase where we, we, we uh, consult with our key internal and external stakeholders. P uh, phase four is where we actually do the planning and the developing while we consult with staff and to make sure the plan can be operationalized and approve, uh, achieve approval from the board. Phase five is actual implementation where we translate our strategic goals and into an operational plan and budget where all uh, plans such as board improvement plan for student achievement and well-being, operational and budgets are aligned with our strategic plan. And the last phase is monitoring and reporting where we, we monitor progress towards these goals using key indicators, reporting to the board of trustees and the stakeholders. As recommended next steps, strategic planning requires a very strong commitment to this process across the whole organization. And while much of the phases can be handled by internal staff, the objective approach of an external consultant will help to develop and support trustees and staff will be involved in various components. An external consultant will help guide and bring clarity to this process through facilitation, specifically during brainstorming and analyzing components in some of the phases. Uh, $25,000 has been set aside in this current year's budget um, to provide support in that area for the strategic planning process. Also, the new board of trustees and senior staff um, should participate in an introduction to how this process will work, 
Uh, a briefing session usually held within the next month would help facilitate the beginning of this process. Um, a committee should be established so that uh, we can maintain focus and momentum uh, and, and complete the planning process. The size, the composition, the terms of reference should be determined through the chair and senior admin. And one of the inherent challenges in, uh, in beginning this process is the fact that we have new trustees on board uh, as of October 14th and normally um, it is suggested in this guidebook that trustees have a year into the job before um, we begin strategic planning. But um, I believe that this framework and the current strategic plan that is available um, online that we probably could develop this multi-year plan by the end of the school year for implementation into the next school year. So I present to you this evening this process above which will build on the strengths that we already have in our organization that will integrate student achievement and well-being, operational reviews, budget evaluation and long-term planning process and also be mindful of the obligations and internal responsibilities this planning process will seek to be a viable, strategic, focused, and relevant process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Paul, and then Anthony, and then Arlene. Th thank you, um, Madam Chair. The, the question I have is in regards to, I guess, phase three of, of uh, what, the, um, what the ministry has sent out to all boards. Uh, and that's community consultation. I know this is something that Trustee Danko has talked quite a bit about uh, as well um, on what part that plays in helping uh, in this process, developing the process as we go along. Um, so uh, I guess I have two, two questions. How one does the uh, community town halls that we hold annually mm -hmm. at the board play into that? But what other plans do the, does the board have to, um, to further community consultation during this process and in what timeline are you looking at? Through you, Madam Chair. This perfectly aligns with your uh, motion to have town halls and I think this is a good opportunity where you can be out uh, obtaining that information from key stakeholders so you could almost align that town hall with this process. And uh, secondly, uh, the second question you... during this process? Well, I think when we develop the strategic planning committee, that would all be outlined how the, how the committee wants to proceed with gathering that, that information from stakeholders. So the committee, um, that w they will determine who are the groups that we want to obtain information, what will be our strategies, um, who will be the, how will we consult with them? Will it be town halls? Will it be through online surveys? So that will all be determined through the strategic planning committee and that would be communicated back to the board. Anthony Quinn, please. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, as the director, do we not have sufficient numbers or, or expertise to take on this project without spending the extra $25,000 uh, internally? Uh, I know it's a uh, it's a want and has been budgeted, but do we not have the expertise in, in on hand already? And if it's meant to be objective, are we, the elected officials, not meant to be the objective voice at the school board rather than having to bring in someone at ex extra cost? And, and a, a second question is, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll hold that question, thank you. To you, Madam Chair. Um, hopefully we don't spend $25,000, I put that amount in the budget, but uh, yes we do have expertise that could probably facilitate a discussion among trustees, but um, in my experience and through other board experience, it's all about um, having someone who is, doesn't have, um, an, uh, that has an objective approach, that has no tie, that has no um, relevant for uh, making sure that what their thoughts and their wants are in into this plan. So the idea is to have a third party who has no, I guess what you call skin in the game that would want to make sure that we get everybody's ideas out on the table and that they're heard. 
You had a second question? I did. I see that on October 21st, the values were changed, and they're meant to be the starting point for our new strategic plan. I'm wondering if the new board should not ratify those values if we are going to base our own strategic plan for the next five years on values that were passed just days before the election. Did you see a copy of the new plan that Andrea published last October? I just want to know if you had a copy of it, or maybe we can get one from... Pardon me? Not the strategic plan, but remember with the values and all the discussion? Through you, Madam Chair, under Phase 2, under Section A, that will be where we validate the mission, vision, and values as part of this plan. So that will be the opportunity where trustees can look at that. Helena? Through you, Madam Chair. In Phase 4, I just noticed that in Point I, it says review with Board of Trustees and approve. And I was wondering about also adding the trustees near the brainstorming strategic goals section that were involved in that, but I think I heard we are or we're not, but I just wondered, are we involved with that aspect? Yes, you are. Okay. Arlene and then Anthony Danko. Thank you, Madam Chair. I like the way it's laid out. I think it's pretty comprehensive. And I mean, we've been, I was around and so was Anthony. You know, we've been through this once before, so I think this time it can go fairly streamlined and probably more efficiently than the last time. We did have a third party facilitator last time. So I guess part of my question speaks to that in terms of if there's a pool of facilitators who the board knows of that would be, you know, be up for consideration, because I do recall that there was a tidy sum that was attached to this the last time around, and I don't know that we want to get that exorbitant this time around. And the other question, I suppose, is, because I didn't read it closely enough, is who is on the committee? Because as I recall last time when we did this, all the trustees were involved at most of the stages. We had regular meetings. I think it was once every other, if not every month, it was once every couple of weeks to sit down and go over. Through you, Madam Chair. Yes, we will look at, through the chair, to develop the committee, and if all the trustees want to be on the committee, that's perfectly fine, but we'll have other staff as well so that we have the broad range of voices that are at the table. Okay, Arlene. Thank you. Yes, through you, Madam Chair, there are a number of people who have expertise in that area, and so I will be looking out to see who might be available that could support that. Anthony, I believe you were next. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for the director for bringing the summary of the strategic planning process to us tonight. I mean, this is with Bill 177, this is a major portion of the trustees' role in the province. So this is, you know, first of all, whether or not we would really decide to outsource a major portion of our job to a consultant, I think should be up to us as the elected officials of the board, and to spend money on such a thing should also be up to us as well. So it should come to a vote at the board table. I think that the document you've provided us with is a good foundational document to begin a policy as the core of a policy document that outlines strategic planning. So a strategic planning policy that incorporates the existing town halls. The town halls should be incorporated as a consultative portion of the policy and codified on that, and we should vote on a policy and work on a timeline to have that policy, because right now it's a working document and it's a guideline. But once it's a policy and all the trustees have agreed on how we want to consult with the public, 
how we want to move forward, how we want to prioritize and set goals uh, and targets for this board over the next phase of the planning cycle. I think that all needs to be laid down in a policy that the public can see and that we agree on. Uh, also, any committee formed by the board would have to be voted on and ratified um, uh, and uh, established as a subcommittee according to our bylaws, um, uh, which are on our website. So I think that that committee, as many as trustees as possible should be on that committee, uh, as many as superintendents who bring each of their portfolios to the committee and they bring their priorities to that committee. Each superintendent should present their portfolio to us uh, with priorities that they've seen and how they want to present those priorities to the public uh, and then we decide from there which ones get acted upon the next, uh, in the next uh, planning cycle. So I think this is a good start and I think that, um, uh, like I say, this document should be brought forward to a policy committee and that we decide at that committee when to complete a, pol a strategic planning pol policy document. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wasn't suggesting to outsource the development at all of this uh, strategic plan. Only someone could guide us through the process. And um, the external consultant would bring experience and expertise to clarify and streamline this process. So that wasn't the intent. And as a staff report uh, this evening, the next meeting would have been an action report where trustees would approve the recommended next steps to begin this phase, uh, phased approach. If we were to develop a policy on strategic planning, um, it would take numerous months to complete uh, a policy on strategic planning and we would be three months down the or two months down the road in, into developing a policy before we even begin this process. So that, that would be my only comment. Anthony, do you have anything further? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, as I said, this, this, the, there's no reason why certain aspects can't work in parallel. Uh, I'm not um, saying that uh, we wouldn't begin the next phase of development without a policy until a policy is in place. I mean, we have a, a nice head start with this document, and um, we should have some policy in place prior to the most of the work being done and approved by the board. And I think that if we want to have a consultant, that should be up to us. There shouldn't be uh, a consultant hired without our approval. Yeah, well, just one more thing. Um, so the Board of Trustees are responsible for developing uh, a multi-year plan. Um, there isn't really um, any choice. So uh, that would be on, on the, uh, the recommendation. And this committee, the Strategic Planning Committee, um, would be established to assist only with the consultation and the gathering of data, et cetera. It, they wouldn't be the ones that actually write the plan. We would all write it on, on the committee to do that. So that was the intent of hiring an external facilitator. So next steps. Thank you. Student trustee update, Chloe or Joel? Chloe? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, um, as we usually start off our months with our um, student trustee report, just to do our kind of reporting underneath our pillar of believing, belonging. <coughs> um, so, because Jason isn't here, I will be covering his part as well as doing mine. Um, so Jason's pillar this month was achieving. So traditionally at Corpus, Corpus Christi, what they do is the week leading up to the Christmas break, they like to do, um, so like they have one thing dedicated um, every day of that week to donating to a charity or doing a charitable act because it is Christmas and we obviously are in that time of giving. Um, so they put an emphasis this year, especially on giving to different charities in the community and doing as much as possible in the week that was given. So on the Monday, what they did was collect mittens and donated that to the Salvation Army. Um, on the Tuesday, students wrote Christmas cards that were later de delivered to a local nursing house. On the Wednesday, candy canes were handed out to students who were demonstrating um, an act of kindness. 
On Thursday, canned foods were collected and donated um, to Partnership West Food Bank. And then on the Friday, C4, um, that's kind of like the little Christmas crew, um, they had a Christmas concert and they sold those um, and each ticket sold for $2 and then that was um, as well donated again to um, their partnership with the West Bank, uh, with the West Food Bank. Um, so you kind of just see how um, it was all centered around, even though the students got to um, participate in a Christmas concert and they got to do a lot of fun things that week, there was also an emphasis on giving back to the community and they didn't forget that aspect of you need to give back to your neighbors, you need to do this, you need to do this because you are indeed in a Catholic school and just being a good person and it's kind of hard to forget that with Christmas and wanting to receive a lot so it was kind of nice and refreshing to hear that they do this and that they have this dedicated um, to, um, they have this dedicated to giving back to people and have students thinking of the less fortunate. Um, so that concludes Jason's um, report for achieving. So then I did it under the pillar of believing. Um, so at Christ the King in Burlington, the students held a Chancellor fundraiser. So they had a food drive, um, a coat and winter, and a coat and winter uh, drive, clothing drive as well. Um, so the students were able to collect 250 items that they donated to shelters in Halton. And then as well, the grade 11 students are continuing their mentorship program um, by having mentor mentee lunches where they sit with their grade nine students who they're mentoring and are able to kind of talk to them about high school, guide them through high school, and have them uh, ask them any questions that they have or any answer any anxieties that they feel towards high school and what they're going through so far. Um, and then finishing off as well, Bishop Redding, the grade 11 leadership group, um, they're about to launch their Jeans for Teens campaign, which um, what, um, what happens is that students bring in jeans and then in, in exchange have a civvies day, so they're out of their uniform. And then with that, we donate it to teens in um, the community who kind of maybe struggle to buy clothing or don't have enough money to get kind of solid pair of jeans for the winter. Um, so we're getting ready to launch that. It's going to be our second year. Um, last year, it was really successful. I think they had um, upwards of around 300 to 400 pairs of jeans that they were able to collect. Um, so it's our second year. So hopefully we're looking to double that. But um, I just know that the students are looking forward to that, especially that student being jeans out of uniform. Um, so with that being said, I am done with my um, pillar for believing, and I will pass it on to Mr. Will. Uh, thank you, Chloe. Uh, I'm going to be reporting about the schools in Oakville under the pillar of belonging. Uh, at St. Ignatius of Loyola, there was a formal dance for our students as always, but what I wanted to shed light on was the last week of December before the holiday, holiday break, um, the Loyola Life Skills Club hosted a Christmas dance for the best buddies. Um, this event instilled the feeling of belonging acro across everyone involved. Um, I think some of the students involved with best buddies kind of lose out from a dance, so having dances for them um, enables them to have just as much fun as everyone else. And it's a good way of showing um, that, uh, sorry, from the buddies having a special night with their friends to so the volunteers involved in making it the night successful, it truly felt like Christmas to everyone. At Holy Trinity, their new club called Team Unbreakable has kicked off. Um, this club is a group of students who raise awareness for mental health uh, while running long distances. Uh, they did a 5K run in December, and it proved to be very successful. Uh, the team seems to be really popular among students, and hopefully we'll hear more from them in the future. At St. Thomas Aquinas, the student council worked tirelessly to organize their Movember celebrations and their winter formal. A grade 12 student at their school volunteered to shave his head in order to raise money for prostate cancer research. The student raised over $1,000 for the wonderful cause, so that was fantastic. Um, the giving continues with the charitable work for the Stephen Lewis Foundation, spearheaded by their Peace and Justice Club, uh, as well as the, Cana uh, the Canadian Blood Services Blood Drive uh, to be hosted next week. Um, at this point, this is all I have to report under the pillar of belonging, um, but I also have our general, general report. Um, there's only two main things that we're kind of focusing on as of now because of the break. Um, the first thing, we're collecting submissions for the OSTA CBC um, Keeping the Flame Alive magazine, a newsletter which spreads news of the positive effects of Catholic education in Ontario. Um, we, we're keeping it to um, student senators just because of the time frame. Uh, the submissions are due, uh, sorry, not October, <laughs> January 9th. Um, so it's quickly approaching, and we are guaranteed one submission in this newsletter. Um, so we're excited.
excited to see our board representing. Um, the other thing we're trying to move forward with is our bullying prevention contest, which is something we do every year. Um, we're asking senators to spread the news of this contest in the school. Um, one of the students from my school, actually, Christine Feliciano, has designed a poster, um, and we've left a QR barcode, which students can then scan with their cell phones and then be guided to um, links helping them with guidelines, rules, deadlines, et cetera, um, just so that all the resources are there. Um, we're hoping to have these, uh, um, have the senators distribute these in their schools um, sometime by the end of next week. We're also encouraging schools to have um, inner competitions within their schools for the winning submission. So for example, at Loyola, um, we are offering a $50 gift card to iTunes um, as an incentive to create um, more submissions. We really want to gain interest and um, really more than the actual prize or gift, it's the interest around the cause and bringing awareness to bullying prevention. Um, that's all I have to report right now. <laughs> it's a lot to take in. Um, we'd be happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank you very much. I just want to say that I think you, all of you are doing a stellar job and I don't know if we all appreciate how much work you do and it's unfortunate that you have to leave us for further educational journeys. <laughs> but uh, I guess we understand. Um, I, just, I, I was lucky enough to be able to attend the assembly at Notre Dame. I guess that's Jason's group. Uh, right before Christmas, it was on the last day of school, and I, I don't have the number on the tip of my tongue now, but they raised an unbelievable amount of money, and I'm sure your schools all did too. It was fabulous. They also had a Best Buddies uh, dodgeball, I think they had, and it it, the pictures were fabulous. I love the mentoring that you were talking about, Chloe. I think a lot of uh, problems would be alleviated if we'd had this when I was in school. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, and please thank Jason when you see him for me. Does anybody have any questions? No? Thank you again. Educational field trips, Superintendent Nahr. Thank you. Uh, the report is before you of the journeys that some of our students are taking over the next few months, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Anthony? <coughs> Sorry, if I may have skipped ahead, I was, I was looking at the, uh, the trip to France to visit uh, Jean Vanier's uh, retreat. Is that included here? Yeah. It was an individual page. Could, uh, could I get a little bit more background on how the students are chosen, or is it based on uh, those who are available to uh, afford that expensive trip? And what kind of fundraising or other... Uh, sorry. So that's not... That's what yeah. It's not the educational yeah, trip? Yeah, sure that's a little bit yeah. later on in the, uh, the agenda. That, that's overnight, night, 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 night. Okay. And I will hold my question. Any other questions right now? Superintendent overhaul and the concussion protocol, and it looks like a very good report here. Nice and colorful. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just going to get the PowerPoint set up. Madam Chair, what my plan is to go through the report um, and then be able to go through a couple of pieces of the protocol uh, that I think would be of interest to, to trustees as to how it will be uh, played out. So I'll go through the report first and I certainly will answer any questions related to that and then go over uh, the two areas of the identification and management of concussions. So the purpose of the report is to uh, review the Halton Catholic District School Board's revised concussion protocol and that uh, was based on policy program memorandum 158 that uh, was announced back in March 19th, March 19th of 2014. Uh, the PPM 
requires that all school boards in Ontario uh, have and develop and maintain a policy procedure protocol on concussions that include the following components. Uh, strategies to develop awareness of the seriousness of concussions, strategies for the prevention of concussions, a process for identifying a concussion, management procedures for a diagnosed concussion, and training for board and school staff. Uh, it needs to be in place by January 30th of 2015. Just a background, we all recognize that the health and safety of students is critical in, uh, for them for learning. And research has shown that a concussion can have a significant impact on a student in many ways, cognitively, physically, emotionally, and socially. So therefore, it's important as the adults that we take the necessary steps to respond, first of all, to try to prevent those from happening, uh, making sure that the awareness is out there for, for all, uh, both for students, at the parents, and our staff, but also responding in a timely manner so that uh, we can effectively address those conditions. Uh, one point that was clearly brought out in the research is that the seriousness of a second concussion that happens prior to um, a concussion, first concussion being uh, healed can have catastrophic uh, events for a student, uh, for an individual, especially for young individuals with their brain developing. So the Halton Catholic District School Board did have a protocol before. That protocol had been in place for a number of years, but that addressed only the return to physical activity. The new PPM specifically address both the return to physical activity as well as uh, return to learn. So all school boards were to base their protocols on the Ontario Physical Health and Education, which is uh, note, uh, known as OFIA, uh, the protocol that they have established, which is the minimum standard set by the province. So the Halton Catholic District School Board back in, in March worked with the Halton Public the District School Board and the Halton Public Health Department uh, to localize the OFIA protocol and to meet the needs of the students in Halton. As a board, we developed our own steering committee as well that looked at that further protocol and it, it included school administrators from both the elementary and secondary schools, our health and phys ed education consultant, a health and phys ed education secondary school department head, a risk management consultant, special education represent representation, one of our consultants and chief psychologist, uh, a student success itinerant teacher, and our, our OECTA elementary and secondary representatives were also uh, on the committee. This committee examined and refined the joint committee's protocol to address the needs of our board and the result of the work was a development of what we are calling our C uh, package, which has is on your table, and I will go over those in a minute, the package that I did present to you. C1 to C5. C1 is the entire protocol. C2 is a tool to identify a, suspe a suspected concussion, and I, again, I will go over that in a little bit more detail. Uh, C3 is the monitoring medical examination form, and that's a form that parents use to indicate the results uh, of a diagnosis of a concussion or not a diagnosis by a medical doctor or nurse practitioner. C4 document for diagnosed concussion, and that is when uh, an individual has a concussion and the steps it they take to get back into the classroom as well as back to physical activity. And the last uh, package C5 is the concussion prevention strategies. The parents, and it says in the report, parents and student consultation has taken place. Parent consultation has taken place. I do have a committee of parents. Uh, what I did seek out parents in our system that have had children who have experienced a concussion um, so they get their uh, expertise and their knowledge, not necessarily the ex expertise that they want to have, but they do have that knowledge of having a student go through uh, a concussion 
and we've uh, met once. We're going to continue to meet to get feedback from them. Student consultation, we have had a pilot in one of our schools with the curriculum uh, program that has been set up by the Halton District School Board. Um, they've gone through that in one of our high schools, but we are, will be setting up as well a uh, student consultation group of students, again, who have had concussions, and we'll be meeting with them to get their perspective on how we can get that awareness and prevention piece out to students through students. So uh, appropriate school board policy, uh, medical conditions has been revised to incorporate the requirements of PPM 158, a new administrative procedure, uh, B171 con concussions, which will be uh, presented to the policy committee next week, uh, has also been created. And as a board, we have addressed the various aspects of the PPM. Uh, many areas in the awareness phase, curriculum lessons, training for staff and administrators, uh, concussion library, online library and resources. Uh, what our website will be uh, soon put up. I'll give you details of that as well. A concussion 101 video. I didn't have enough time because of the amount of information I have, uh, but it certainly would be worth if you're interested in, in uh, viewing the 101 video. It gives a very brief uh, but concise synopsis of uh, concussions and what is required for our students and young young people. Uh, it's about a 10 minute uh, video. We have frequently asked question sheets, uh, initial parent communications will be sent out, a webinar in March for our parents through CPIC, uh, posters and so on. Uh, our prevention, we have our C5 pre prevention strategies and curriculum lessons that address that. In the identification and management, a team from each school has been trained uh, both in elementary and secondary uh, identification and management charts uh, that you have at your table have been created to uh, visualize the process established and to post visibly in um, many areas of the school. Again, as I mentioned up the, the front, the C2 and C3 packages and C4, uh, return to school frameworks, many packages that are on StaffNet and available for staff. We, our board created their own classroom concussion symptoms and accommodation tools for both our students and our parents and staff to be able to utilize when students come back. And uh, parent concussion information package is also available and created. Uh, our training will be ongoing. Uh, it is, as you can see on the report, a uh, number of staff that have already been trained. We are going, to, we are working on a module for our occasional teachers that they will be able to uh, access and be able to go through, um, as well as our coaches and other important staff that not necessarily our teaching staff will be required to use as well and be trained in. So the Halton Catholic District School Board has worked collaboratively with other stakeholders to develop a comprehensive protocol based on current research and best practices to address students who have sustained an injury which may lead to a diagnosed concussion Recognizing that concussion research is ongoing, our protocol will continue to evolve with the development and implementation of this research. As a board, we continue to make the health and safety of our students a priority to ensure that our students can thrive in all areas. Our new concussion protocol, protocol enhances that commitment. I can take any questions related to the report um, or I can go right into the identification and management piece. Are there any questions right now? Yes, Paul? You, just, uh, you mentioned the, the webinar. Who will be doing the presentation uh, on the, the CPIC webinar in March? Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, it, for sure, I will be part of that. My, my hope is I'm trying to uh, secure some medical personnel that would be able to provide the information on the medical piece. However, I've struck out in the numbers that I've tried to get. The, the ones who are certainly in demand have been um, tapped into quite a bit, uh, so I'm, I'm still trying to secure someone. If not, I will certainly get the information that I can relate to it, but uh, that's my hope that I can get the medical personnel and myself to present our protocol. Thanks. 
So I'll go through, I, I know it's a long uh, PowerPoint, I'll try to, some of it will be repeated that it was in the actual report, uh, but I will, will go through the protocol with you. Um, again, it's, uh, the presentation specifically goes into the identification and management piece of the concussion protocol. And so what it will be, will be a, a review of the PPM, um, go over the process and review that, uh, background, the rationale for the implementation of the protocol, um, and our actual protocol will be shared with you with the emphasis being put on the identification and management piece. As I, I mentioned, PPM 158 uh, was released in March 2014. Um, we do have a current protocol in place. Uh, the background ministry acknowledges about uh, the health and safety of students uh, are essential conditions. And as I mentioned before, it does have a significant impact on students and the, the, the need to really identify what concussions are to make sure that uh, everyone is aware, not just uh, staff and students, but parents and community members as well. The actual PPM was created by a number of, of ministries, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, Ministry of Tourism, and educational organizations uh, as OFIA. And uh, they were the ones, again, that released the protocol OFIA, uh, which I spoke to in regards to the components of that. Our board steering committee uh, consisted of the following individuals. Again, I won't go through all those individuals, uh, but we had a, a, a number of individuals with um, a wide range of experience and from different areas that uh, certainly gave their input for the protocol. And as well, uh, our parent consultation committee as well. And I certainly appreciate uh, the time that all the people for the committees put towards uh, our protocol. I'll go over the definition of a concussion and I won't go word by word, but I wanna point out a few important facts. Um, they're gonna be on the next four slides, the definition. Uh, first aspect that I think really needs to be brought out is that um, it, it is related uh, and it has a function that uh, speaks to the changes in function that can occur in terms of the physical, cognitive, behavioral, and sleep patterns of, a, of an individual when a concussion or brain injury occurs. And it certainly doesn't have to be a direct hit to the head. It can be um, a blow to any part of the body, but if it jars and moves the head and the brain rapidly, that is what is going to be the impetus of a concussion. Important that it, it can occur, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone who becomes unconscious. Um, a hit can happen and they're still conscious and we'll go through both of those scenarios as well. And again, it can only be diagnosed through a medical doctor or nurse practitioner. Um, there's many um, devices that uh, can or can't be used, but those are what we are taking is again, through the PPM that only a medical doctor or a nurse practitioner can diagnose a concussion. So again, the, the five documents that I mentioned in the report, and specifically, I'll, I'll be going over the identification and management piece right now. You have the pieces in front of you, so I have a bigger version, and you may need these if you want, wish to follow along with it, of the colored chart along with the C2, C3, and C4 forms will help you through the next aspect of the presentation. So we'll go through um, the actual chart here, and we're looking at the right-hand side uh, of the chart in the scenario of identification. So the possibility of first one of a student 
who, I'll give you an example, a female basketball player is, is, runs into an opposing player causing her to fall back on, hit her head on the floor and she lay motionless, motionless and is not responsive. So looking at the flow chart, uh, we'll review that the unconscious student on the right hand side and the color coding of the chart refers to the actual individual. So the yellow refers to the student, the blue refers to the teacher, coach or the supervisor, the red refers to the principal and the green refers to uh, the parents in terms of their responsibilities. So if a student is unconscious or was unconscious for any length of time, um, we immediately would uh, stop the activity and have emergency action plan where we call 911. Uh, someone stays with the individual, they don't move them, they don't remove any equipment unless they have some expertise in regards to doing that. Um, and they wait for medical personnel to be able to come to address the situation. And obviously the student would be uh, taken to, to the hospital for the ambulance. Um, the, even if this child were to come to, uh, again, the 911 call would still be initiated and the ambulance would still be coming and would be taken to the, to the hospital. Uh, we would contact the parent or guardian and making sure that uh, they are informed either for them to be able to come to uh, the area where the, act, the incident happened or directly to the hospital. We would provide them with a copy of the C2 form. So I'll get you to take a look at that form right now. And what you can see on that form is um, signs and symptom chart that allows um, individuals to be able to identify um, possible concussions. Uh, obviously with this individual going to seek medical attention, uh, that doctor or nurse practitioner would be the one that would be um, looking at those signs and symptoms and checking off certain things and they would be letting the parents know where that student lies in regards to a concussion or not having a concussion. If they come back that a concussion has been diagnosed then the principal would inform an appropriate school staff and we would go to the management piece of it. Go to the left hand side where we have a situation in which a student may have had a hit to them but they are still remain conscious. Um, when a student receives a, a blow to the head or face or neck or the body and is significant enough that the teacher or coach is concerned or a student shows signs or expresses symptoms such as being dizzy or, or um, kind of headaches and so on, then um, the student is going to, the individual is going to go and check the student to make sure that they're, they're fine before they move them. Um, they're going to take them off when they're able to do so in a safe manner and then use this identification uh, of a suspected concussion to see if there are any signs or symptoms um, that are there. If at any point in time any one or more of those signs or symptoms are uh, prevalent, then that student would be taken out of that activity. Um, and they would be re removed and follow the same process. Not obviously the information would be relayed to the parents um, parents would get the C2 form and the C3 form and they would monitor that student o over the next 24 hours. And while they're monitoring them, seeing if any signs or symptoms do appear because signs and symptoms can appear well after uh, the period as to when the individual has been hit. If any signs or symptoms do appear, uh, then again uh, they would report back using the C3 form indicating that uh, yes, signs or symptoms have appeared and they're going to go to a medical practitioner to see that or that no signs or symptoms are there. Um, if the fact that there's no signs or symptoms after the 24 hours has happened, um, then at that point in time, um, the student would be able to return to school 
at normal activities taking place if there is no signs or symptoms during that 24 hour period. The, the last uh, scenario is again a conscious student um, receives a hit. Again, same type of situation where the coach or teacher pulls that student uh, off after they've um, checked them out, uh, making sure that they're safe in the activity and, and remove them. They go over the C2 form. They don't see any signs or symptoms at that point in time. Uh, if they don't see any signs or symptoms, still, if they see that the hit was severe enough that symptoms could possibly um, present themselves later on, they are still removed from that activity. For example, if they're playing a football game, um, inter school where they're playing another team and they, they come out, but the coach sees that they were hit hard, uh, possible concussion, and they go through the C2, they don't see any signs or symptoms, um, but that um, impact was hard enough that they feel as though they have some concerns, that student would remain off that uh, field, would not be returning to that activity um, for at least 24 hours until, um, again, monitoring would be taking place. That is probably going to be a challenge at times for us, um, particularly when students um, have that desire and passion to keep on playing, uh, but again, as the adult, we want to make sure that that student in the long run is going to be able to do many activities, particularly the learning aspect, um, and be able to get to back to return to physical activity as well. So uh, again, the um, information would be relayed to, to parents. Um, within that 24 hours, they can come back to school. Staff would be monitoring that student as well. Um, within that 24 hour period, if they see any signs or symptoms, they would inform the parents as well. Um, and again, any signs or symptoms would lead to, re lead to C3, where they would have to go to a medical practitioner to uh, seek um, medical attention if there is a concussion or not. Any questions with the identification process because we were going to be going into the management piece which is a little more in depth. No? Okay. So the management piece, so this is where we now know that a student has uh, a diagnosed concussion. Uh, first step is that the student needs, needs rest and mm -hmm. step one would be that they would um, stay at home for that physical rest. Uh, principal is going to inform uh, their staff uh, of the situation where a student has received a concussion. Um, the principal uh, would create a collaborative team, which I'll talk to in a minute. Um, and again, when that rest period is completed, um, we would make sure that one of the forms, so if you go to C4, there's a number of forms that are uh, in those forms. Each of those forms require uh, signatures to take place, whether it be through uh, parental signatures or staff signatures uh, for the individual to be able to proceed to the next step. So again, the first important stage is, is rest. And after the supervised rest, uh, the student could possibly have symptoms still but they're improving or none of the symptoms are there. If the symptoms are improving but they feel as though that the student is capable of coming back to some form of um, learning at the school, then the collaborative team would be um, put together and that team would look, um, would be led by the principal and would include the parents uh, or guardians, the actual student who was concussed, uh, school staff and volunteers who are going to be interacting with that student uh, during a regular basis, and if, if possible, the medical doctor or nurse practitioner, and whether they're at the table or not, uh, obviously their voice would be there as well through uh, the parent. 
So that team is there to help that student work their way back into uh, school, uh, usually on a gradual basis, and depending on what signs or symptoms are still present would relate to the accommodations and um, that would be required to take place. We do have, as I mentioned, uh, the signs, uh, symptoms and accommodation forms that would be able to be filled out, uh, probably be filled out more than once depending on the severity of the concussion um, because a, a student would probably take a little while to be able to get to the end um, where they're fully able to uh, return to full learning. Again, depending on the situation, every student is going to be uh, different in terms of their uh, recovery, uh, but it could take days, could take weeks, could take months uh, before a student is fully recovered and symptom free. So that's why that collaborative team is so important to be able to continually monitor uh, the accommodations that are required. The, the other aspect is a, a student could return to school um, after they've rest and have no symptoms. If that's the case, they would return um, right to step 2B, which is regular um, learning activities and regular class activities, and that'd be the same for a student who has those symptoms but have improved to the point where there are no symptoms, then they would get to 2B. And that would be at the same time as the same process where they are ret the return to physical activity takes place as well and that is step two of the return to physical activity. <coughs> that piece takes place at home where the student engages in, in individual or light aerobic activity only and again the parent is the one that is monitoring that and signs off to say that they have completed those tasks and are ready to go to the next step. That's just a review of what I just went through. Um, there are six internationally recognized uh, graduated steps for return to physical activity. Um, each step must be at least 24 hours um, and depending on severity of the concussion, again, may take uh, days and weeks uh, to be able to get through each of those stages. So the f step one, um, w it's step two, of the physical activity, they, they again, they're at home. The next step is they're able to, they've done so at home without any signs or symptoms returning, and they come back to school and then they participate in individual sports specific activities. Uh, for example, like running, uh, if they're on a basketball team, they can um, possibly shoot some baskets around, but they wouldn't take, pay, take part in any uh, physical um, or game competitions. Again, as, as you see through on the, the chart that talks specifically about which of the forms that the uh, individuals would have to sign off on, uh, A, B, and C are, are parental signature forms, and um, D, E, and F are the ones in which um, school contact and medical personnel would, would sign. So after, again, they've done their um, sports-specific activities, and again, there's no signs or symptoms that are prevalent after at least a 24-hour period, and the, the form is signed by the parent saying that that's taken place. Then the student can move to step four, where they engage in activity but with no body contact. Um, with this, uh, again, the student would um, be able to take part in, in their activity specifically that they're a part of, um, whether it be a football team, a hockey team, but again, they wouldn't be um, allowed to participate in the contact part of it. A lot of times in some of those sports that they would be what they call either red-shirted or yellow-shirted so that individuals on the court would know that that student needs to be, to be cautious in regards to that person on the, on the full floor or the ice. Uh, once that stage has been completed, then they would go to, this is the only time where a medical doctor or, or nurse practitioner 
would be required to sign off to say that they are totally symptom free and that they are able to return fully to uh, physical activity. So when that happens, um, they would be able to return to physical education classes, they'd be able to return to um, their sports teams. However, if there is a team that they are involved in that requires contact, one more step would be required and they would be required to uh, take place, take part in a, a physical contact uh, practice before they are able to go into a full competition. And again, signing off on all those um, from e, E1 to E2 would be required. And then once that is taken place that they again return to full contacts. At any point in time throughout that return to physical activity, there's a possibility that signs or symptoms can reoccur. If that does happen, there's a form that we have in place, it's is F, um, where the, the student would have to return back to the beginning um, and it would be back to the return to learn aspect because in order for any student to return to physical activity they have to be totally symptom free um, and they would have to go through the process. So it is one that we we know it is going to be time consuming, it is going to be um, onerous in regards to the number of uh, contacts, however certainly believe it is vital that uh, we, we go through the process and we follow through on, on all the steps for the benefit of that student as they move forward in their educational career and in terms of their own well-being as well. So those, that's, I tried to go through as quickly as I could and tried to be as precise as I could in regards to the um, amount of information. This was a, a whole day, half day in service for staff. Uh, I tried to give it to you in the probably about 10, 15 minutes um, and I probably missed some items and, and uh, if you have questions I certainly um, would be happy to answer them. Mark? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a question to do with concussions outside of the school, hockey. And um, when the kid comes to school and says, I had a concussion in hockey, um, I, I'm assuming that um, we don't know what protocols they follow. Um, and um, what responsibility is there on the teacher? to um, to do something about this this notification if they receive it right to you madam chair thanks good question uh, I if we are informed uh, and that's why we want that awareness piece to be out there to um, all of our community uh, particularly our parents that if a concussion does happen which it will happen outside of of the school as well as within our school um, environment our protocol would stay the same. So if they're coming in and we're aware that they've had a concussion, we would go through that protocol as if it was happened within inside. Obviously, we know that a concussion has been diagnosed. We would go, we would start at the C3 form and go to C4 in terms of the return to learn piece. So we'd have that collaborative team come together, speak to the parents, and then go through the process. So we, we want to find out as quickly as possible um, that that concussion has occurred so that we can initiate our process. And again, one thing that is clearly brought out is rushing a student back at any point in time, particularly in the learning stage, can cause significant um, damage to students because, again, their brain is, is a muscle that's, that's developing and needs healing. And um, that learning piece can have a detrimental effect if we're pushing them too hard. So that's why we really want to find out as early as possible to make sure that we're gradually returning those students throughout the process. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, there were no doctors on the concussion steering committee, is that correct, Superintendent? Through you, Madam Chair. There was no doctors on our steering committee, our board steering committee. Yes. Uh, through the collaborative uh, team, the Halton Catholic Board, the Halton um, District School Board, and the Health Department, uh, they did have uh, a doctor who did correspond with them on the that aspect of it. 
So to follow up on that then, um, a meeting with a family doctor can take several days to get an appointment and the, the C3 form, which may be uh, two or three different visits to the family doctor could lead to days and days and days out of school if they're not being allowed to return without that. And just to follow up, um, are we not taking the responsibility out of the parents' hands? And this, this seems a very paternalistic way to address a medical concern that a parent would be more likely to, to be the one responsible for rather than the school board. So if, if my son or daughter is injured, I, I would take it as my responsibility to have the, the medical profession check out the, uh, the symptoms and, and assess it and care for it myself and not be required to have principals or volunteers get involved with the, uh, the medical care of my own child. And, and following that, are we not overstepping the bounds of privacy and medical records by having uh, this, the, these instances so public amongst the school and the board and a team, as you called it, that uh, parents <coughs> may want to keep these, uh, these medical conditions private amongst their, their family. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, addressing the first question, which I, I, I think the question that was asked, uh, certainly staff are not expected to diagnose. Um, however, there are going to be situations where they are going to be the adult that is going to be present at a situation, whether it be in a phys ed class, whether it be out at recess time, whether it be at a sporting activity, um, that they're the per, per, parent in, in uh, at that point in time. They're not a parent, no. They're local in local parents. Um, that they are responsible for that child at that time. Um, are they diagnosing um, a concussion? No, but they have a tool that they are required to do to be able to identify if there's any signs or symptoms which puts back to the parents to say, we have identified, we've uh, noticed that they are dizzy, they've had headaches, they're complaining about not being able to answer simple questions. Um, that that's, again, I agree that it is parents' responsibility to go and seek that medical advice, but as a school and through this protocol and this PPM, it's our responsibility to be able to help in that identification process. Um, again, not being the one that diagnoses it, but to be able to help to identify that there are signs and symptoms that are, are present. Um, and your second question was? Well, about the privacy. Privacy. The collaborative team is is one in which um, the parent would be part of, um, and so obviously the parent would certainly have a say as to who would be uh, present at those meetings. However, the only individuals who certainly um, would be part of that team would be the individuals who would be in direct contact with that student, whether it be the classroom teacher. At the secondary level, it could be four, four teachers that they're going to be in contact with. Uh, principal or vice principal would be uh, obviously an individual that uh, could possibly um, one of the two would be on the team as well um, and depending upon the school we do have a what we want is a point person uh, a person that the parent would be able to uh, contact on a regular basis and know that this is a person I can go to um, and have that contact with it could be um, as we had on here, our student success teacher at the second layer level, if the administrator decides that that's going to be a point person, it could be uh, a special education teacher at the elementary level, it could be the physical education resource teacher. Um, it would depend upon the school. And depending uh, on the number of concussions I could possibly have, and, and looking at their secondary panel, chances are they're going to probably have more concussions, and again, I could be proven wrong uh, as we go through down the road. Um, we could have more than one point person because if we have a number of concussions at one time, uh, those individuals. So parents would have some input as to who is going to be receiving this information. But again, that information is important to um, be disseminated to those individuals because they are going to be dealing directly with those students. Thank you. If I could follow up again through you, Madam Chair. So if a parent decides or is sent home one of the one of the C forms and it says we noticed that your child had banged their head in the school ground and complained of a headache 
and we'd like you to have this investigated. Would the parent not be able to say, I believe my child is fine, and send them back to school the next day without one of these forms? Or are you requiring this parent to, to follow the school's direction on the medical care of their child? Our protocol would be we would expect the parent to follow through. These are signs. To follow the, sorry, excuse me, to follow the, the board's direction on the medical care of their child. We would expect them to follow the protocol that we have in place, which would be if there are signs and symptoms that are present, we would expect that they would have to go to a medical practitioner um, to either say that there is a concussion or not a concussion for us to be able to move forward. Excuse me, and thank you. And what would be the remedy if a parent says, I believe my child is fine, they've complained of no further consequences, I'm sending them to school the next morning? Certainly we'd want to, through you, manager, we'd want to certainly have a conversation with them and try to, again, it's the awareness piece to make them understand the seriousness of the position they're putting their child in. Um, even though it may be a simple, they think a simple headache, Again, the, the signs or symptoms can present themselves um, a week down the road, um, a month down the road, and the fact that it gets presented right away um, is one in which we would impress upon the parent that it's, it's important that they go to, um, through our protocol so that, again, the, the best interest of the child is at, is at hand. So, um, we would ex expect that they would follow through on that. I want to follow up one more time. And if they don't follow through, we, we are saying as a board that we are going to dictate how you care for your child's med medical condition. I if they don't follow through, we would certainly have to have a discussion as to where we'd proceed. Um, we would be putting ourselves in a position um, of concern if that child, knowing we have a protocol in place, and as we move forward, that child demonstrated further signs of a concussion and led to um, serious conditions. I think we would be putting ourselves in a uh, serious legal um, position that we certainly wouldn't want to be put in. Thank you. Further questions? Yes, Helena. Do we have many students who are concussed, or how many do we have? Through you, Madam Chair. At this point in time, we, we don't have a baseline data for that. Uh, we know we do have concussed students. What we do, uh, I am planning on looking at, and I have a, uh, set up a meeting with our research department that we're going to have information that principals are going to be asked to fill out once concussions are um, diagnosed at their school so that we can start getting a baseline and identifying where those concussions are taking place, whether it be at school or out of school, and if they are happening at school, where those prevalencies are so we can get more data, and then from that data, we can help in terms of that prevention piece to see, you know, these are where at this school a lot of concussions took place. How can we help in terms of preventing some of those? So we do want to get that data, and we are moving forward with that. Thank you. Arlene? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, Tim. This is quite extensive and <laughs> lots of stuff. Uh, it, am I understanding this correctly that anyone who does have a concussion doesn't get back into school education or activity without a doctor's note and something written from the parents that acknowledges that this has happened? Through you, Madam Chair. They, they wouldn't need a doctor's note at that point in time, but they would have to go to a medical practitioner and the parent would sign off to say that yes, they have gone to that medical practitioner to say that they have either a diagnosed concussion or they don't. So that's C3. So we're only asking for, because it does cost in regards to get those notes sometimes, we're only looking at that one time when they return totally to physical activity. When they are diagnosed with a concussion, we're asking the parent to sign off on that form to say that they've gone and this is what the medical practitioner has, has mentioned. Anything further? Thank you, Tim. I think I'm on next.
next again. Right? Am I on the next one? Keep it rolling. So I can stay from here. Um, so through you, Madam Chair, the report before you is the extensive trip uh, advisory committee trip proposal. And uh, the following trip, um, those trustees who were uh, at the table last year, um, Jean Vanier uh, Secondary School organized uh, the same trip, uh, but for a number of reasons were not able to proceed um, with it. So a similar trip is planned for the end of April of this year, where students and staff will travel to Fa France to visit uh, their school's namesake, John Vanier. Uh, certainly opportunity for Catholic student leadership, um, and they are going to be chronologically, chrono chrono chronicling um, the journey and discussions with John Vanier, uh, and certainly sure that they would want to share uh, with the Board of Trustees if, uh, if they so wish, if you wish them to do so. Uh, so I present this to you, uh, the trip uh, that is scheduled for uh, the end of April of this year. Uh, please to answer any questions. Anthony, did you have a question? I did through you, Madam Chair. It was just how the students are chosen and how they'll be raising funds for the trip. And if just another question came up, did we consider inviting um, Sir Vanya to come to the school rather than bring the mountain to Moses. Tony? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this had been put on the table last year as the school was uh, embarking on its official opening, and we had, in fact, invited John Vanya to come to the school as part of the blessing. Uh, because of his age, he no longer travels. That's the first piece of that. So we then tried to organize a group of the Cornerstone st Committee students to go to Jean Vanier. And unfortunately, as uh, Superintendent Overholt said, uh, the response was not there in the school community. And we're not sure this year again. So going back to your comment in terms of which students, first of all, we need to have students that are excited and interested and wanting to be part of it. And um, we thought we had it last year uh, with the blessing. We're not sure this year. We're, going, we're praying that the interest is there and they are trying to work with the school community. So that's where we're at on that. Just to follow up then, would you consider extending that offer to other schools on the board? Tony? never really done that and at this point in time uh, it, 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 it's the school community that's trying to generate the interest because of the name and because of John Vanier and who he is we're going to put it out again th we're putting it out again for this group this year we'll see if there is no interest perhaps that's what we're going to have to do next year I'm sure just through, through you Madam Chair uh, one concern I think we have when we do bring other students to uh, another school trip is usually the supervisors are from the school that is organizing it and they don't know those students so that, that's somewhat of a dilemma as well um, if we have similar numbers that we can provide another supervisor from that other school that's where it would, it would uh, kind of fit in and would be a little more uh, logical to be able to do so any further questions? Uh, Jack, I believe you would like to give us a report on Catholic Faith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before I begin my remarks, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge and thank Terry Durham uh, for, for continuing to remain with us this evening. Uh, for the reading of this report, I, many of you would not know that um, Terry is very highly regarded in religious education, in both in the board, regionally, and in the province. She does work with ICE. She does work with publishing companies, and and tonight alone uh, came from Notre Dame from an AQ in religious education that she is teaching. So. Uh, we're very, very lucky to have uh, Terry on our team. To introduce the report, I'd like to thank the uh, HCDSB research team led by Dr. Erica Van Roosmalen, as well as Terry, who co-authored the bulk of both the staff report 
and the up outcome monitoring report be you have before you this evening. Each highlights our grade seven and 10 students' achievement in their religious education programs. We have reported in a slightly more detailed way on the results of the grade seven religion <coughs> assessment. As you may know, this assessment is unique in the province of Ontario as far as we know. Uh, it's only HCDSB that administers this religion assessment. It consists of two sections, a multiple choice section and a series of three open response questions based on scripture. The assessment includes material up to and including unit eight of the grade seven religious education program. There are 10 units in total. It is administered on two separate days within a five week window that occurs between the last week of April and the end of May. After the test is administered, the school's grade seven teachers engage in moderated marking to assess student achievement. We have produced a guide to assist teachers in this process and to assist in the consistency of marking. Like all large scale assessment, the results of this assessment give us information upon which we can modify our instruction to better meet our students' learning needs. In a more broad sense, page four of the monitoring report and page five of the staff report provide only a snapshot of the wide variety of programming The Halton Catholic District School Board, in partnership with Home and Church, is dedicated to providing excellence in Catholic education by developing Christ-centered individuals enabled to transform society. Daily, principals and teachers in our schools engage in a wide variety of activities that make our schools distinctively, distinctively Catholic places of learning. As a group of curriculum consultants, special ed consultants, and itinerants across both departments, we constantly strive to infuse faith into all aspects of our work with teachers. Our Catholic faith is an anchor in all our instruction. The grade seven assessment is only one measure of the faith learning that happens in our schools. It can truly be said that every mark a student earns in every subject in all our schools partially includes a religious ed mark. Earlier this evening, our uh, religious ed consultant, Terry, provided some highlights of the new religious education program which we are rolling out in the next few years. Our current grade seven religion assessment was developed in the era where neither curriculum expectations nor common achievement charts were available for religious education programs. In the absence of these, our teachers developed both the grade seven assessment and evaluation frameworks for grades two, five, and seven. Within the new curriculum, as you've heard, however, both expectations and the achievement charts are included as the basis for determining what students should know and how they should be evaluated. In light of this, our board will need to reevaluate this current grade seven religion assessment in a few years prior to the implementation of the new grade seven program. I do have a copy of both the teacher's guide and the religion assessment components. If any, any uh, trustee would like to view them as we have not included them um, on eScribe or in your packages. And Madam Chair, through you, I welcome any questions you might have for myself or Terry at this time. Thank you, Terry and Jack. Any questions? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I found the results alarmingly poor. And the, um, the spin the authors given this report is a concern for me and likely for the parents of the board. Uh, on, the, on the open questions, to find that 53%, 61%, and 48% were not able to reach beyond level two is of concern to me. And I'd like the authors to address that, please. Jack? Through you, Madam Chair. We share in the concern. Uh, we 
acknowledge the issues with the uh, results in those to be based on some more widespread issues that we have in our student body around the use of critical thinking and application in responses to questions like these. These are things that we're dealing with across the curriculum. They would be common in other subject areas and they are one portion of that exam. Um, and, and you'll see that, for example, the multiple choice, the knowledge-based questions are significantly better. Uh, we have significantly better results. But I, we do share in that concern and we are working on those aspects to improve um, our, our students' expression, um, putting their thinking on paper, and also their critical thinking skills. That's, that's good to know. Thank you. And another follow-up question was, um, how does the uh, such low results in the open questions uh, jibe with only 7.1% of the students uh, achieving report card marks less than level three? So there's a, a very big distinction between the, the marks that students were able to, to reach using the critical thinking process and the high marks achieved on the report cards. So the report card marks, uh, through you, Madam Chair, the report card marks uh, encompass um, different types of experiences that we ask our students to engage in. Uh, they would not only be paper and pencil types of experiences, a uh, more robust evaluation through looking at observations that, that are uh, uh, done in class, conversations that are had with students, as well as student products. So that, mo that uh, mark at the end of the uh, learning represents representations of different types. Uh, and again, that would be something that uh, we would say uh, would be seen across curriculum areas and not just in uh, this particular area. Arlene? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, um, just to piggyback off of uh, what Anthony was, was questioning, I'm wondering, um, with our uh, special needs students and identified students, it, are the numbers built into this? Are they included in these numbers? So they're, if that's not broken out, then that may, uh, in, my, in my world, that would contribute to some of the lower. Yes, they are included there. Uh, we have not uh, analyzed this as granularly as uh, we might um, disaggregate data from EQAO scores. Uh, but I will say, that accommodations would be made as well for our re our religious education, uh, sorry, for our special education students, depending on needs. We would expect those accommodations and those additional supports to be um, available for them as well. So are any students exempted then fr from writing this? No, we exempt, uh, exempt no one. Uh, we provide the, the support that might be necessary to do the best possible um, job on, on uh, completing the assessment. Helena? Through you, Madam Chair. Is um, this mark included in their report card as a percentage of the report card mark? Uh, teachers are, through you, Madam Chair, teachers are able to consider this assessment in the final report card mark. We are finding that, generally speaking, uh, teachers might assign a value of about 5% of the total mark. Anthony? The other question I had noted was uh, of that 50-odd um, percent who don't make level uh, 3 or 4, can you break down for me how many of those are in level 1 and are, or in level 2? Is the majority of them close to level 3 or are they really down the scale? Um, I could... Madam Chair, I could uh, find that information out um, in terms of the breakdown of, of levels one and two um, and provide that to you. Anyone have anything, Paul? Yeah, just a question um, in, in looking specifically at the, the grade 10 report card reaching level three and four, do you have any, any idea, this is a broad question, on, any idea on the, the, on, it doesn't necessarily need to be grade 10, but on the variance of, of religion marks versus the average of the students th themselves? Uh, we could do that analysis, uh, Madam Chair, and um, 
I, I suspect that um, the the success rate in our religion courses uh, would mirror the the success rate at levels three and four in our typical um, courses at the same level. So I, uh, if you'd like that information, we could request it. And right. Pa a follow up on that because anecdotally, I would suggest that not the case now, but I think that um, um, some secondary students, um, given higher averages within their religious courses, may not necessarily take this seriously as they should, uh, those courses, because they're able to attain. I don't think that's the case wi from a widespread perspective, but I think that with uh, I think in certain situations, it, it could be where, th where the, the actual grade itself are, are that much higher than their, than their averages, or, or the their ability to attain those grades are just uh, easier in, in the next course. Um, three, Madam Chair, I don't think there's any evidence um, to suggest that the course is any easier or harder or seen that way than others. Um, so I, I have heard in some boards that, uh, actually in, in one board that I've heard of that, you know, students in the senior grades don't seem to do as well in religion courses, which would be a concern to me. But that doesn't seem to be the case in our board. So um, I know that talk is out there, but I don't think there's any evidence to support that, particularly in our board. Carrie, did you want Carrie? to address that? In our secondary panel, religious education is given the same rigor as any other subject and I might agree with you that to start with when a student enters a course they might say oh it's just religion but I can assure you that the teachers treat it um, with the same uh, standards that they would treat any other subject that they're delivering and that the students very quickly learn that religion is just as rigorous as any other subject that they're taking. And I would agree with Jack, al although we haven't done those reports, that their achievement in religion in secondary would be similar to their achievement, particularly in um, English, because it's very um, literacy-based. Religion's very literacy-based, especially at, in the academic level. Anthony? Could I follow up then with Terry through you, Madam Chair? Um, one of my thoughts in reading the report was that was, was to ask, is the priority of religious education high enough amongst the other subjects so as to see such low results in the grade seven uh, testing of the open questions? Are we giving the same uh, priority to religious education as we are to the other subjects? I think we are giving the exact same priority, if not more, because we are in our religious education very conscious that it's not limited to one subject for a short period of time, but that it extends into our entire school day. And that's part of our focus on faith. I would like to just um, add to that, as, as Jack pointed out, when you look at the student's actual knowledge of their religion, when you look at the multiple choice, you can see that it's much higher because it's 73%. The open response questions are three questions based on one reading of a parable and then three different answers where they, they analyze the parable, they use their prior knowledge to answer a question and then they apply it to life. So they're at that point doing some critical thinking about their religion pieces and I think that our students are capable of thinking critically about their religion but not all of our students are capable of writing that down in an answer that's sufficiently supported with evidence. And I think that's why you're seeing that drastic difference. And so I think that we, we can't ignore how well they actually are doing on their multiple choice, which is aligning closer to their report card mark than that, even though it's three questions, it's actually one question, like an ABC. And, and I think that um, we have to take that into account. And applying answers for critical thinking and using and supporting that with evidence from your reading is an area that students struggle with in both um, their literacy and their math 
it's an, it's an area, although we have very high scores in EQAO, that is one area that comes out over and over, so students across our system are working on that in general. And I think that we're seeing some of the effects of that in our religion assessment. And if I may add to, add to that, Madam Chair, uh, critical thinking is a, pro a priority in our uh, board improvement plan and continues to be a focus of our professional development work with our teachers. Thank you for, the, thank you for those answers. I think uh, if we could see those questions as described, that would help me to understand the, uh, the results better. Thank you. Thank you. Arlene? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if, if, Jack, you're putting any kind of numbers together, I'm sorry to add more work to it if you do do it, but could we get some kind of a percentage on identified in there? Because I, I think this is an incorrect representation as it would be if we were doing EK, EQAO without <coughs> factoring in all the different identified students and students that were exempted, et cetera, et cetera, because I know when we have those numbers, it, that's all affected by those instances. Okay, through you, Madam Chair, I, I don't know how this particular um, test a result is recorded, whether it has been recorded by student number that would tie all of those factors together. So um, if it has not been, uh, what I'm hearing you say is that we'd like to c begin collecting that data um, <coughs> to tie those factors in to the result. Because uh, uh, again, we're, um, I'm not sure whether that, if, if Dr. Van Roosmalen was here, we'd be able to answer that question definitively around whether we can make the correlation. Um, so if it has been collected in that way, we can do that immediately and I can bring those results to you. If, if they have not, I will take that as a suggestion for recording future results of the test. Thank you. I think that would just give us a more accurate representation Agreed. of what is actually happening because if we do any kind of a test across the board that's, that's purely academic, say math, all those factors would be there and it would be all broken out. So I think this is a little bit unfair to the students who have the comprehension problems or need that extra time where they're seeing a question maybe for the first time and they're having to break it down to A, B, C and they simply don't have the capacity or the time to do that where they're, you know, they're getting all that proper assistance that they would on any other subject. Anything further? Uh, secondary religious exemptions, Director Dawson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to provide a process, an updated process to trustees that we are following uh, when a request for a secondary religious exemption uh, is requested. As you've heard numerous times tonight uh, in our district, religious and moral education is not and must not be a one subject among uh, many in the students' timetables, that it's infused in all classes and materials during the school day. And we're using the Ontario graduate expectations as the foundation for our reflective vision for where we want to see our students and our learners uh, go, and it's rooted in our distinctive Christian anthropology and view of the world, and it's it provides a distinctive approach to publicly funded Catholic education. Um, so what we have done is we've taken an approach where we're communicating these principles of practice uh, to our parents during grade eight parent night so that families are aware of the historical mandate of the Catholic school system in Ontario our Ontario Catholic School graduate expectations and our expectations for secondary religious education. Um, so a standard resource was created by a board, Dufferin Peel, uh, based on some recent rulings and we have uh, benefited from the work that that board has done and number of secondary principals, superintendents, and myself took that document and made it uh, a Halton document. And what I've included in your package this evening was the principles of practice 
which is um, the slides that we share with our grade eight parents at the grade eight parent night <coughs> that talks about what Catholic curriculum is, the Catholic learning environment, Catholic staff, and Catholic community, and what that really means when our students uh, from uh, either from our own elementary schools or from uh, other public schools when they come to our secondary schools. And I've uh, attached those slides for you, and those slides are also utilized by all our secondary principals at those grade eight parent nights. I've also included, and, uh, these, and these slides are shared especially with what we believe for our Catholic graduate expectations, foundational outcomes used by all of our Catholic schools in the province, our vision for learners, and describe our purpose. Also in your package this evening, um, we expect our Catholic students to participate fully when they come to our secondary schools mandated by their baptism, and our non-Catholic students are expected to participate to the extent they can. There is uh, called Appendix B. This is the process for requests for when uh, we might get a request from, uh, from a parent, and how that request comes in. Sometimes it may come from um, to teachers or a chaplain, and, and the process that would occur. If it goes to guidance department, how we handle that. Normally, um, the request comes to the principal, and that's the, the main focus that we, we would want to have that occur. Because when, when that request comes in, what we're finding is parents really aren't uh, understanding the, the good value that can come from um, a secondary religious education course. And for the most part, um, the parent realizes that it's beneficial for their student to, to take that course. Sometimes a request comes to me directly, and as you can see, I would um, always write the letter acknowledging. There's always an acknowledgement letter, and then it's referred back to the principal for them to be in contact. There's some discerning documents that uh, our board and our principals have developed with questions that can ask the parents and walk them through why they would request this and perhaps uh, how we can support them so that that, that exemption isn't uh, followed through. So I'd be happy to take any questions from trustees. Thank you. Um, I will say that I was very happy in speaking with you about this to find out that a lot of these requests, the people have changed their mind after speaking to staff and, and whoever's involved. That made me very happy. And then I was also happy to learn that you're very quick at sending out the denial letters. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? For you, Madam Chair, I'm wondering if our board has a, a reserve, a legal reserve to defend this policy as was challenged in the Dufferin Peel Board mm -hmm. and how far we would go to defend this policy and not granting exemptions right away as uh, promoted on the myexemption.com website. Yes, and, then, and there's much uh, language around the, on that website that parents are citing. Um, our, what we've benefited from is the legal advice from Duff and Peel, and they've prepared all the letters that we have incorporated into our document. Um, and a Catholic student who, who, a student who comes to uh, our school from one of our Catholic schools does not really um, comply with being exempted and we have some documentation and we have some legal support in that area. Um, open access students who request, they have a legal um, standing to be uh, exempted according to the Education Act. Um, so in a way there's, uh, one is easier to obtain than the other. Uh, what the Dufferin Peel case uh, was more about was exempted completely from religious ritual activities such as retreats and masses. And what we find in, in our district is parents are really only requesting the course exemption. They see the value of being um, a, a, a community that comes together to pray. Um, so we're not getting that part of the exemption request. 
We don't have um, anything set aside right now in uh, a legal budget for that purpose. And what is the answer to the student who would qualify for exemption and they are asking for it not for religious reasons but for the opportunity to take a, a credit that would they feel would benefit them more for their post-secondary goals? Through you, Madam Chair, if it's uh, an open access student, we, 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 by law, we'd have to grant that request. Our Catholic students, we, we counsel, we coach, um, we talk to them, we have the parents in, we try to deter that from happening because they are a Catholic and uh, according to the Education Act, really do not qualify for that exemption. Through you, Madam Chair, then. So are then students who are applying for a finite number of spaces from our board at a disadvantage for programs that require certain math or sciences when the Catholic students are required to take uh, religious education uh, credit and the open access student would not be. Correct. That they are disadvantaged. But we, what we would try to do and what we have done in the past is students require um, for their program that they're taking. And for the most part, the students who request exemption are in grade 12. They're at the end, so they need prerequisites. And uh, there's, there's online courses, there's um, summer courses, so we would try to facilitate that for them, other than dropping the course. So on the record, we've said through you, Madam Chair, that students in our board are at a disadvantage. Our Catholic students, according to the Education Act, yes. Any further questions? Thank you very much for answering my questions. Um, Anthony Quinn, miscellaneous 11.1. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, I was approached by a fellow parishioner and a member of the St. Vincent de Paul Society uh, in Oakville and she's also a member of the Halton Poverty Roundtable and had asked if the board had followed through on discussions to bring the Canada Learning Bond information package to parents during the JK registrations in January. I, I sent this item to the director and she informed me that Superintendent Negro had taken care of that and I've just gonna ask uh, Superintendent to follow up and put on record that we will have those documents in the JK registration package available in January. Thank you. So noted. Yeah. If I may, Madam Chair. Um, yes, we have been uh, on this for the past uh, year or so. Uh, a presentation was actually made to the trustees in the last academic year on Smart Start. Um, we have disseminated information to uh, schools and I was looking on some school websites. I, I was on Mother Teresa's tonight and they have the flyer that we made available up on their school's website, which I was pleased to say. So we are being uh, very aggressive in letting our student population, sorry, our parent population know this. Uh, you, you should all know that 10%, uh, the Halton Poverty Roundtable estimates the 10% of Halton residents live uh, below the poverty line. So in our numbers, that means that approximately 3,100 of our students uh, could be living in poverty. And so that translates into about $6 million worth of grant money. And we want our students to have access to all of it, all of that money. So uh, we will continue to uh, make this program be known. We, uh, we have meetings on a regular basis with HPRT. They have presented at our um, uh, poverty sessions. We had one in December last year where they, they gave a presentation on the Halton context. And we had one in October of this year where they were part of a panel. Um, so we have a good relationship with HPRT and we'll continue that. And we'll make this information available through the kindergarten registration package and other means. Thank you. Further, Arlene? 
Um, just, I'm sorry, I didn't put it on the agenda. I just wanted to remind trustees that I believe this Friday is the last, is the cutoff date for anyone that wants to register for the OCSTA governance courses. Um, they, they sent out a reminder, but in the event, yeah, yeah, certificate courses. And if, uh, you know, if anybody's interested, by all means, jump on it, and they're looking for more people to participate. Just a reminder. Thank you. Yeah, I think Anthony and I are both taking the certificate course. I don't know about the modules. Anyone else interested in that? You talk to Helen. Uh, there's no correspondence. Yes, there is. Uh, no correspondence, but perhaps I don't know what when to bring this up or not. To, uh, is this the moment, the miscellaneous moment that I was approached by um, somebody about the Ontario from the Premier's office promoting well-being at school? The Ontario supports program to encourage children and youth to get more daily physical exercise activity about implementing 60 minutes of physical activity for kids connected to the school day. Just wanted to bring that forward if that's been yeah. looked at. Jack, do you want to address that? Yes, we, um, we began participation in that particular program last year and are continuing this year. Thank you. Okay. Any further? Uh, we need to make a resolution for Diane's absence tonight. Will someone move that, please? Paul, seconded by Mark. All in favor? Okay. Uh, we don't have to go back in camera, so if we could go to our lean, please, for our adjourn. No, we need a motion to adjourn first. Sorry. Anthony, seconded. Anthony, all in favor? Now, please, Arlene, may we have our closing prayer. Thank you. I, I will apologize because I just realized my name was on there. <laughs> um, but uh, if you join me in the sign of our faith, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I think we should take a few moments to reflect. Uh, we've all had wonderful Christmas vacation. Uh, we're starting into our last stretch, if you will, and I know it'll be a busy time for everyone. So I would look to our Lord to help us and give us strength as we move forward and to be open and receptive as uh, we always should be, and I believe we always are. If you could just join me in an Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.